too much material. I was kind of hoping I could compress time, but as Andy said, it just finished when it finished, so and I think that was a good place to stop. But we're in the section now where we're looking at, you know, Seth, how does the Seth material fit into this big picture kind of approach to anything that we do? <clears throat> and I wanted to make a few points about you know, what, who and what is Seth? We always, Seth says, and, and Seth said that, and here's Seth said, who is this Seth? And he self-describes himself as an energy personality essence, no longer physical focus. You know, we know that that's a standard thing to us. And the, we have to ask the question, does Seth have an autonomous existence in another field of consciousness? I think the consensus in this room is yes, absolutely. But we have to ask the question, well, what if it's not? What if it's all merged somehow and it's not completely autonomous and there's these inner penetrations, interdependencies and whatnot and how it affects the energy exchange that's going on. And Seth uh, delivered this descriptor of himself. He called himself a bridge personality. That's neither fully Seth nor Jane. It's a hybrid. And my hypothesis is that this develops in stages that we can map in the developmental terms that the developmental psychologists, Colbert, Gilligan, Graves, Piaget, on and on with, with their methodologies to get, get a ballpark of how this works. Jane, in her aspect psychology, called him a personogram, which is an interesting analogy, a metaphor that she used. It's sort of like, you know, a telegram coming, but the telegram is alive and personified and in fact has a greater field of vision and access to information that the focus personality does not have. So the point, the important point here, and this is just based on my interest in channeling and having observed Mary Ennis in over 500 sessions and uh, Serge and Chris in, uh, I don't know, over 30 or 40 now, as, as I'm engaging you I you, as we're talking right now, I, you have a sense of my personality, my energy, that I'm projecting, and I have a sense of you. As I'm engaging Elias or Chris, and I sit there and go, well, this is not Chris's autonomous native self that's coming through, and it is not Surge either. What the hell is this thing? Well, it's a hybrid. It's a personality, and we put such authority on what this hybrid says to us, and that's why just circling back to the Seth as an infallible source and to have that be axiomatic, as relative as that can be, but to, you know, yeah, okay, he's infallible, but he's really pretty damn good, you know, as, as all good sources are. Okay, next. <clears throat> so then moving on finally, the, the closing part of this, I didn't even get this far, the integral approach, which is probably good, because, you know, the people who aren't here didn't want to hear it anyway. <laughs> And, and the folks that are here are ready for this, this introduction, this overview. So the definition of the word, word integral is balanced, inclusive, comprehensive. And as developmentalists talk about differentiation and integration, we're at a stage where after the splitting of the value spheres, and, and it's so fragmented right now, there's this move towards integrating things socially, big picture wise, globally, global thinking, global systems in place to help solve the problems that the more fragmented approaches can no longer solve. In my opinion, it provides a thorough method in which to explore this you, the ontology that we saw, this I, 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 creates my, my, my reality. It combines the gems, the things we can save from pre-modern, modern, and post-modern research. We don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. And it doesn't reject any approach 100%. As Wilbur says, and I think it's rather clever, no one's smart enough to be wrong 100% of the time. <laughs> and on the other hand, nor are they smart enough to be right 100% of the time. None of us are. We're, we're all fallible sources, so we're kind of wrestling with a way to acknowledge that and move forward with that. And it's, but it still seeks enduring truth. And this is at the core of all good science. Really, any good scientist, they just want the truth and something that's repeatable. And it's a very noble thing, and we want to keep that modern value with us. So what is the integral approach? The way I try and tell is that it's, it's the first viable postmodern theory of consciousness. And we'll talk more specific about it. But in general, it, as I am learning it over the last six years, it provides a set of checks and balances. It transcends yet includes. And that's developmental speak. But the acorn is in the sapling. The acorn goes away, but it's there in the sapling. It's there in the tree, the sapling and the acorn. Or it transcends yet includes. And again, purely framework one terms. 
So it combines, it's seeking to combine. It's not there yet as a theory. This is bleeding edge, what I call vacuous edge. There's no blood left yet, you know, because it's still emerging. It can be applied to everything, really. Research, business applications, political science, education, healthcare, spirituality. There are two highly developed integral theories currently available that I strongly recommend you check out. And if you can attend those seminars, if you're interested, anything by Don Beck, you want the transmission directly from Don Beck. He has three-day seminars, level one and level two. Joanne and I have been to four or five of them since 2003. And the guy is obviously a master at using this system. And he actually used it over a period of 15 or more years in a multiple number of trips to South Africa as a consultant working with Mandela and other government business officials as they were struggling through getting rid of apartheid and doing it without civil war. And they succeeded. And Don is not the kind of guy, he's the Lone Ranger. He's like, where'd that masked man go? It's like, oh, he's already on to the next thing. He's not sitting around there waiting for the pat on the back. So he doesn't really pat his own back that much, but anything by Don. And it's a great introduction because it deals with memetics, the emerging science of memetics. And we mentioned earlier, I think Jim did in his introductory comments of Richard Dawkins' book, The Selfish Gene, which is where the term meme was coined. Dawkins, as a materialist, a hardcore materialist, was looking for an analog to the gene. The DNA structure had been uh, discovered in the 50s, I think, it just outlined, you know, the, the genome project was going full force. J Jane and Rob read his book because there's references in Rob's notes to the selfish gene. And J Jane in her poetry, you know, rants against selfish, the hell with those selfish genes, and so on and so forth. Um, but the, the term meme, the idea of meme was coined, and then these developmentalists took it, and particularly in Don Beck's lineage, which traces back to Claire Graves, who invented this, uh, the science of memetics, and he calls it a value-attracting meta-meme. We call it a worldview. It's all of the core belief systems and their interdependencies. He calls it value-attracting meta-memes. And it's, a, it's an empirical way, an attempt to look at interiors and, and value systems. And then Aquil by Ken Wilber is this huge edifice. It's very complicated. And, and it is rocket science for the soul. But this is done by a man who has, has done serious meditation practice for 30 years now and has insight into what he calls state stages of waking, sleeping, formless you know, uh, awareness. And so he brings that insight into this theory. And so it helps to me legitimize it and authenticate it. So I, I'm going to, when do I have to finish? 2 o'clock, 2.15, what, what's my, Jim, you're the official, or give me an official re read on that. 2.15, okay, good. So we have plenty of time. So I'm going, to, I'm going to try, take maybe five minutes or so to go through. This is, the analogy I want to use, this is like a musical scale. So basically what I have up here is do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. It's the core elements. And from, do, from a musical scale, that happens to be a major scale. And just a bit on the music metaphor. If we take the first note, the fourth note of that scale, and the fifth note, bam, 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 bam. Bam, 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 bam. We can create a musical sentence, and a really simple musical sentence. Louie, Louie. It's the core sentence of rock and roll. We can create a musical sentence from that. But from that major scale, we get the sublime beauty of Beethoven's sixth, you know, Mahler's third, Bartok's concerto for orchestra. All come from that, from that scale. So from this scale, there is a potential Beethoven sixth awaiting us as a, as a community, as an integral community out there in my view. And Ken is the first one to say it's not complete. It doesn't tell us how to think or what to think. It's in fact saying these five elements are present right now in our awareness. And if we imagine just a, day, a daily cycle of waking and sleeping, going through a 24 hour period, these five things are present. And so that's part of the map and it's our point of departure. The quadrants are the large, the first one of the large organizing thing. And he typically does just an X and he has four things and he situates 
the interiors on this side and the exteriors on this side. And again, if we think of checks and balances, the idea is so that we don't reduce everything to material bits and atoms, but then on the other side, the idealist philosophers reduce all material things to just idea and consciousness. We're basically saying, if you remember the levels of reality, the exterior and the levels of self, the interior, that consciousness in its essential form is physical and non-physical simultaneously, always has been, no beginning, no end, period, end of story. And is anybody familiar with Christian De Quincey's recent book, uh, Radical Nature? He, he proposes a, a, a trained academic postmodern philosophical view of how that is really <laughs> where we end up, and it's really that simple. So interiors, exteriors, and then are individual uh, dimensions, and the bottom two are collective. So we get interior, exterior, and we add individual and collective. And suddenly, we put two of those together. So the upper left is individual interior, individual exterior, collective interior, collective exterior. And suddenly, we start to situate hierarchies. And I got some interesting feedback. The notion of hierarchies is a tough thing to start to integrate and, and to situate. And apparently, and Ken, I think, has done a good job of a foundational job of presenting this. In this quadrant model, there are four flavors of hierarchies that follow just this. And these are basic perspectives that we find them in our natural languages. And you'll notice when you do your academic writing, you're writing in third person. You're writing in it, they, them language. You objectify, externalize. You're not writing I, I feel, my feeling about this. You're trained, we're trained not to talk about our feelings, about our findings and whatnot. So that, that's a broad thing where all of these other things fit into that. The levels then are basically however we create a stage of levels. And, with, and Ken uses the great chain. I would, if we plug Seth in up here, we would use that III, focus personality. Uh, source self, you know, pyramid energy gestalts would be the levels. Now that's just an orienting idea, right? How does that work? How does that turn into framework one manifestation? The goal of this map comes back to framework one manifestation. The idea is not to get lost in metaphysics with frameworks two, three, and four, but here I am using terms like all that is, pyramid energy gestalts. What do those really mean? These are questions. These are open questions still. So the general altitude center of gravity of our overall self is measured in a level. And that's where the hierarchies come in. That's a difficult thing for us. We were talking over lunch about this with John and Mary Sue. The next thing then, the multiple intelligence based on Howard Gardner's work, basically saying why are we good at some things and not so good at others? And research, if, if you organize it together, has shown that there's close to two dozen different lines. And one is not necessary for the other. But yet, they exist together, and the examples they use are emotional intelligence, our feeling, our ability to feel, uh, interpersonal, how I relate to you, my relationship ability, intrapersonal, my relationship with self and the interiors, kinesthetic, my body, my physical ability. If I'm, you know, some people are not so good at swinging the bat or the golf club or, or the cricket, wicket, whatever <laughs> our friends from the UK call it. Uh, Musical is another intelligence. Aesthetics, uh, linguistic, mathematical intelligence. And I've just run off seven or eight of them. What, what in this country do our SATs, our college entrance exams focus on? Two intelligences, your linguistic and your mathematic. Your emotional, we don't give a damn about that. Well, they do, and they're trying with the writing components and our writing skills, trying to get some first person or other things in there. So. So levels and lines, there's this whole sort of interdependency between levels and lines. And in Ken's present model, he calls it a psychograph where he just maps, you know, you may be high in some and low in others. And the example he uses are Nazi doctors. Cognitive line is very high. They can do materialist science models, develop technology, but their moral line, very low. Egocentric, ethnocentric. How can you how can you operate on another human being, you know, and skin them, put them in freezing water, as, and treat them as a guinea pig? That, it's calling that ethnocentric morality is even a gift. I think it's it's pretty brutal and it's pretty primitive. So so we start to get this picture, and, and what kind of works for me? I don't know how this will fly with the integral folks, but you know a spectrum analyzer when you're running sound audio through something and you see how it's dynamic across the spectrum. 
Well, those are from low to high frequency, so I don't want to confuse that because it's a different model. But if we take all the lines, low to high is going in a different axis. It's going vertical. But if we have all of these different lines, according to life conditions overall during my day, uh, my lines kind of change. When I have to eat, when I get hungry, Joe and I call it going beige, which is getting very primitive, very s survival instinct. I get cranky, grumpy, and I get in my way, all this stuff because it's defense mechanism, and I'm concentrating on getting food in my body. Or when we have to go to the bathroom, a simple, simple physical thing like that, the lines just go down, you know, or, or a nightclub fire, survival instinct takes over. What happens? Your cognitive line, you're not thinking about poetry. You're thinking about getting your body self to safety or helping others. So it's dynamic. A quick question. Oh yeah, the hierarchy of needs, yeah. Abe Maslow is another, another stage model, yeah. And, and that's considered a line, your needs line. And it develops in stages, so that would fit in there. States are very cool, and this helps to situate things too, because the difference between, and Ken uses another word for levels, he uses stages, I've been using that word, so we can substitute that word up here. And he's made some gr good interdependencies between stages and states. And basically, that levels are permanent acquisitions. And just to use a physical version, acorn is acorn. You can't skip it. You don't go to tree. You go to sapling. You can't skip sapling to get to tree from acorn. And that's just the definition of a stage model. You either have it or you don't. And if, and if you're skipping stages, you don't have a stage model according to that paradigm. So these acquisitions in terms of focus personality development or framework one, they're permanent acquisitions. And you can regress through injury, illness, and Chris's story, uh, you know, will, will play to that too with your systems and whatever your, your value systems were going through that. Even though, and once you reanimated with health, those lines are right back. Now the states are temporary. And this plays into altered focus and channeling. Channeling is a state which may develop in stages. We don't have empirical evidence on that, or a lot of it. And so this waking, de dreaming, deep, dreamless comes from the Vedic, Vedantic uh, teachings. And we go through that every 24 hours. And so we access these realms of being as a focus personality. And to me, this is one of the most interesting connective tissues in, in the scale here, in our map, that says we connect to source, to pure, unmitigated consciousness all the time. And everything else does too. And this ties into Seth's blinking in and blinking out and the white hole, black hole, and, and some of that, the way CUs and EEs work. And then finally, oh, let's, we have, we're balanced, inclusive, and comprehensive, so we can't leave out typologies. And the typologies, the most obvious one, male and female, he includes the Enneagram, Myers-Briggs, and I throw in Seth's families of consciousness, which deals with innate intention. And there's a quote back somewhere on the wall that says, you come into this life, you are born with history. And that means source pre-exists framework one and constructs it and creates it. And that's all a Zen paradox that shrivels up itself anyway to try and describe it. But Seth's families of consciousness is his way of saying there are nine basic, he says you can slice up the pie any way you want, but I'm going to do it in a nine. And I'm going to tell you a story of Sumari, Sumafi. Let me, let me go through this. Milume. Gramada, Vold, Ilda, and there's Ilda Andy in his green, with his green shoes and his green shirt, and he's talking about trans, the Ilda family goes between cultures like Andy does, and he's wearing his green shirt today. And that's from Elias, the color code of the families is from Elias, not from Seth. Anyway, you get the idea. There, there's different intents, and they cover you know, wh why we're different, why we're drawn to heal, why we're drawn to teach, why we're drawn to engineer. In some cases, why we're drawn to kill and be a warrior. You know, th That's a, probably a Zuli kind of pursuit. OK, next. I think I got to turn the volume up.
an old alchemical drawing piercing the veil from one domain to another, one field, one framework, however you want to. So, what, what is integral conscious creation? This will be the closing part of this for the next 20 minutes or so, and then we'll have some more questions. What I'm going to do is kind of, we've talked a little bit about integral, and we'll talk some more about integral, but I'm going to start now with conscious creation, kind of where it's been and where I see it going. So the phrase conscious creation has been around for decades in different contexts. Linda Dahl, as far as I can tell, and if anybody knows differently or can prove differently, please let me know, associated that with the Seth material and you create your reality. So it's, we're, we, we use it to represent you create your reality and it represents the Seth material in particular. So, however, we can also trace a version of this earlier than Seth. The point of being that Seth is not the very first one in the history of all that is to suddenly introduce these ideas. And that was the perennial wisdom connections earlier too. But specifically, when we're talking about creating through your beliefs, your thoughts, your expectations, your imagination, these interior qualities being causal in some way and affecting our health, our relationships, we can trace it back to Phineas Quimby and the New Thought Movement. Do a Google on that and you'll get, it, it reads like Seth. It's amazing, and the lineage in, in the American spiritual uh, tradition. Uh, so these ideas aren't new in, in that regard. They're just in a postmodern context. And further, it really extends back to the idealist philosophers, going back to Plato, because his writing survives today. So that's 24, 2,500 years ago. And of course, Plotinus in the second century, Fichte, Hegel, Schelling, and the other idealists who were looking at the notion of interiors and consciousness with a capital C being causal. Not the material world being causal, but really taking it back to consciousness being causal. What, I, what I blows me away is Jane's initiation satori into this is the physical universe's idea construction. I hope it does get published someday because it's only about 25, 30 pages. Maybe it's longer. I, d I did see it at Yale one time and I looked at it and there's like scribbled out so it was the physical world. Was the physical world as idea construction, the world's crossed out. So, you know, it showed the iterative process, what we, what we know as, as publication titles uh, in the notes, it's great. So, and that's why Mary, you're not here right now, but her work is so important too, to have a scribe there uh, to, to, to talk to and ask to go look these things up sometimes. But idea construction, and you read through that part as it's summarized, and it's idealism. And it really, so we can trace Jane's work, and this was foundational of, of all the material that Seth would spend the next 21 years fleshing out. So in a sense, we can cast it and tell the story. This is a version of Western idealism. And the two main similarities are these two very important points. We're going to flesh them out a little bit. Universe is multiverse and involution evolution. I have to define those terms so, so we can ballpark them. But basically, the, from the perennial wisdom, all that is is nested fields of physical, subtle, and causal consciousness. And I will define that a little bit later, but I, I will tie it into the dream state, physical, subtle, and causal, waking state, dreaming state, and deep dreamless state, that in those states we are accessing fields, perhaps, or other domains, and that through meditative practices that we've known about for thousands of years, we can create stable awareness through these states, and in fact, the pre-modern definition of enlightenment is basically holding stable awareness of self, of isness. Emptiness is not nothingness, and it's not annihilating the ego, by the way. It's expanding the ego to its source and its roots. And the second part, involution, evolution, I want to tie that into the levels of reality and the, and the levels of selfhood, the, the notion of interiority and exteriority. And let's just be metaphysical, admittedly, for a moment, and take Seth's four frameworks that he talked about, that each of those frameworks, even though to us, relatively speaking, frameworks two, three, and four are non-physical, these bodies you know, are penetrated there in a ways we don't sense with our physical senses. But they all have interiority and exteriority relative to them. This is, this is the hypothesis. So the notion of involution and evolution is, is trying to get at the mechanics of conscious creation itself. That the basic way of energetic manipulation by all that is, by the one, the one, and then all the many that are present in the one, 
how, how are they co-creating and creating all along? So this is a simple, another kind of musical scale way of just ballparking conversation. Seth's blinking in and out, fits down there in evolution, involution, and the white hole, black hole relationships, and, and, and quantum physics can actually map into some of that too. Therefore, conscious creation shouldn't be limited. I can't sounds very absolute, but I don't think it should be limited to just the Seth material because the basic ontology of being, the nature of being, of universe as multiverse, of us being I, 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 of being much more than just this outer ego, is found in some variation in all pre-modern and modern traditions, spiritual traditions. So this entire you who creates 100% includes some variation, I'm sort of reiterating. This is Seth's term, he called it outer ego, inner ego, and then focus personality and source self were, or Jane's aspects terms, and I'm I'm now adding these terms, physical field, subtle field, and causal field to this III structure. Again, just to ballpark this, it's a three. We can make a four, we can make a 17, and there's different ways of doing this for different purposes. For purposes of introduction, I'll do a simple three. Did anybody see Andy's Uncle Joe in there? <laughs> it took me a while to see a dog head up here. Anyway, something occupy the mind, get the right, right brain, the intuitive side, some of this stuff. <clears throat> so continuing now to talk a little bit about this involution evolution. It's a type of simultaneous action of creation in the most general way. In Seth's terms, involution occurs before the beginning. And he introduces this beautiful Zen-like paradox of before the beginning in dreams, evolution, and value fulfillment in his story of the creation of the world. <clears throat> in, in my view, as a, as a ballparking way to, to introduce this idea, it describes the how, the mechanics of all that is of pure consciousness acting as primal cause, not first cause. There is no first, there is no last, but primal. I like that word better, just there's something primal going on, to create these, these subtle, this causal, subtle and physical fields. And I actually changed the order here into one of emanation, which fits into the Vedantic and uh, Buddhist uh, stories of emanation and, and the theories of involution that come from those traditions. Seth's consciousness units and electromagnetic energy units fit into this very nicely too because causal CUs are, are, are the fundamental primal causal agent in this definition. And EEs are earmarked for physical manifestation. They're not yet physical. They're not yet framework one. They're right there on the edge, that gray area of framework two heading. So that's where we'll call the, the, the borderline of the subtle field. Again, Seth reminds us, all good theorists remind us there's no real separation, real def division here. This is just a metaphor to ballpark our own experience of ourselves as consciousness as we go through altered states and altered focus, which is really what the Seth material shows us. <clears throat> <clears throat> 